It is my great privilege and pleasure to introduce your plenary speaker tonight. Uh, Dr. John D. Payne is the senior pastor of Christ Church Presbyterian in the holy city of Charleston. <laughs> he is the executive coordinator of the Gospel Reformation Network and has led uh, our organization for uh, since 2015. He is a board member of the Banner of Truth Trust. He, in conjunction with Reformation Heritage Books, is the series editor and a contributing author to the Lectio a Continua Expository series. Uh, it was my privilege, I think, to first meet Dr. Payne at the Twin Lakes, Twin, Twin Lakes Fellowship. Like many of you, uh, many of my best friends in ministry have come through fellowship. I'm thinking it was Woodside Cabin number six, but I may be, I may be wrong about that. Two uh, Clemson men found a common endeavor and love for the Lord together, and we have been praying and planning and working for one another ever since. Dr. Payne, will you come and instruct the people tonight from God's Word? Well, I think I came to Birmingham just for those two hymns. That was marvelous. Praise God for his singing saints. I want to read from God's word in Proverbs chapter 21 and have a word of prayer. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. Amen? Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you for the great privilege of gathering together in this faithful church, Briarwood Presbyterian Church, which has for decades, even from the very beginning, been proclaiming the person and work of Jesus Christ faithfully to Birmingham and to the world. We thank you that the, of the model that they've been uh, to our denomination. And we pray, Lord, that tonight we would all be encouraged to fight for that which we love dearly, for Reformed Orthodoxy, for historic biblical Christianity, and for the witness of the PCA. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. December 4th, 1973. It's a date in history that we should all readily know and cherish. For it was on that date that the Presbyterian Church in America was born. At the First General Assembly, there were 338 commissioners representing 260 congregations. They gathered here in Birmingham at the uh, other campus, the prior campus uh, of, of Briarwood Presbyterian Church to officially organize a new branch of Christ's church to the glory of God. This new denomination would strive to be faithful to the scriptures, true to the Reformed faith, and obedient to the Great Commission. The atmosphere at the First Assembly at Briarwood was positively electric. The opening worship service was packed with eager worshipers. In fact, it was standing room only. There was an excitement in the air, a holy anticipation of better days to come. One could sense both joyful relief and courageous resolve. There was relief to finally be free from the soul-crushing liberal environs of the PCUS and a holy resolve to hold fast to the inspired, inerrant, authoritative, and all-sufficient Word of God, and also to firmly resist the seductive enticements of cultural accommodation. On that historic day, the Briarwood Sanctuary was filled with spirit-filled joy and anticipation. I don't know uh, any of this, of course, from personal experience. In 1973, I was two years old and living in a far and distant land called California. No, my knowledge of that historic day in the PCA comes from speaking to men who were there on that occasion, and also from listening to the live recording 
of that first worship service and the early proceedings of that assembly. Now, if you haven't heard uh, the live recording, you need to. You need to listen to it. You can hear it. It's online. On it, you can hear the esteemed Dr. Frank Barker and his associate, Reverend Peter Doyle, lead the opening worship service. You can listen to Dr. John Oliver expressively read from Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. I was actually encouraged uh, to hear that this was the text that was chosen for that occasion, a, a passage that clearly exalts the sovereignty of God and highlights the doctrines of election and predestination and God's eternal purpose of redemption in Christ, a passage which has helped to convince, I would guess, most of us in the, this room to be reformed, confessional. This passage was a strong reminder that from the start, the PCA has had a big God theology at its very heart. Then came the main address. It was powerful. I was deeply encouraged by this no-nonsense, God-glorifying, Christ-centered, spirits-exalting, gospel heralding, battle-ready message given by our first moderator, Jack Williamson, a ruling elder from Alabama. It's one of the best GA moderator messages I've ever heard, and I will be referring to it more later. But something else stands out on the recording. It's the congregational singing. It was awesome like the army of the Lord proudly unfurling and raising its orthodox standards, lifting one as one voice in song as they courageously go into battle against the forces of hell. Listen to it for yourself. It's quite moving. Brothers and sisters, under the circumstances, it shouldn't surprise us uh, that two of the hymns that were chosen for that special occasion, for that inaugural worship service, had battle themes, onward Christian soldiers, a mighty fortress is our God. Indeed, it makes perfect sense. The men in that room had been through a long and arduous ecclesiastical war. Some of them had been in the fray for decades. They valiantly fought for the truth. They contended for the faith. Like Daniel and his three friends, they showed biblical conviction in the face of enormous pressure. They resisted the studied ambiguities and sophisticated equivocations of fellow deceived presbyters. Indeed, for years, our PCA founding fathers fought courageously against the threefold enemies of doctrinal indifferentism, theological progressivism, and rank liberalism which we all know J. Gresham Machen referred to as another religion altogether. Our PCA forefathers did not sit quietly on the sidelines and hope for the best. They didn't ignore the threats to the health and purity and unity of the church. They were sons of Issachar who knew the times and knew what God was calling them to do. Beloved, this is our PCA heritage. It's a heritage that we should teach to our churches. It's a heritage that we should share with our children, especially in these present days of testing and doctrinal drift, which we are seeing not only in broad evangelicalism, but also in some quarters of the Reformed Church. Our PCA forefathers fought hard for Reformed Orthodoxy. They contended for the faith, and they rightly understood the Christian life as a battle. And the Christian life is a battle. Amen? It is a battle. Sometimes in our own day of, of material prosperity, our, our nation is at a place where there's a lot of material prosperity. The church can become very soft. We forget that we are fighting against Satan and hell. In the great hymns of the Reformation, it's uh, clear who the battle was against, not just against discomfort but against the powers of hell. This is a daily battle, a daily battle with the world and all of its allurements and deceptions. It's a battle with our own sinful flesh, and it's a battle with Satan, 
the wicked father of lies who seeks to destroy our faith, who seeks to destroy our families and to take captive the minds of our children, and who seeks to destroy our churches. Dear ones, I've heard it said that the Christian life is not a playground, it's a battleground. God's word is clear about this. These battle analogies are all over the word of God. In Ephesians 6, 10 through 13, Christians are exhorted to put on the whole armor of God. Why? That we may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle or fight against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. I think that many Christians get riled up over politics more than they do about the spiritual battle that we are engaged in. You don't hear anybody in conservative politics speaking about this spiritual war. It's a different kingdom. It's the kingdom of man. But we are in a battle. The powers of darkness. This is how we are called to view the Christian life. Dear one, do you view the Christian life in this way? As spiritual warfare. The Holy Spirit tells us in verse 16 of this same chapter, Ephesians 6, that Satan himself is firing flaming darts at us. Jesus himself warns us that the devil is seeking to kill and steal and destroy everything in his path. Peter warns us that the devil is prowling around, seeking someone to devour, seeking churches to devour, seeking denominations to devour. If we believe our Bibles, then we must believe that it's always wartime in the Christian life. Amen? It is always wartime in the Christian life. Therefore, we, must, be, we never, must never let our guard down because our enemy never rests. And dear ones, we don't want to be found asleep on the battlefield or believing the lies and the propaganda of the enemy who would seek to sabotage the mission and the message of the church. Paul urges his young disciple Timothy to fight the good fight of faith, 1 Timothy 6.12 and to suffer as a good soldier of Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 2.3. Paul warns him against worldliness, stating that, quote, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one, now listen, who enlisted him. It's battle language. Philippians 2.25, Paul refers to Epaphroditus as his fellow soldier. And in some of his final words, the apostle declares that he fought the good fight. Our PCA founding fathers understood this battle all too well. Indeed, they lived it. And they understood more than anyone that the most challenging threats to the church's biblical orthodoxy are usually not from outside of the church, but from within the church, from within her seminaries, from within her agencies, from within the ministries of influential pastors. Yes, the challenges to orthodoxy most often come from within. It's not state-sponsored persecution that usually spoils sound doctrine. It's the church's fascination with man-centered religion and cultural acceptance. The hymn writer expressed it well. It's with a scornful wonder that men see her, the church, sore oppressed by schisms rent asunder, by heresies distressed. The fight for orthodoxy in the church, the contention for sound doctrine, is a perennial battle. It didn't just start in the 1960s in the PCUS. This was just one battle in, in one branch of the Lord's church at one time in history within this epic spiritual battle that is taking place in the world and has been raging since the fall of mankind. One writer explains it this way, quote, The church's life is one long war from which there will be no discharge until what the apostle calls the day of Christ. You cannot understand the history of the church until you understand this. 
Another insists that, quote, war for nations might be hell, but war for the church is its calling. Let that sink in for a minute. War for the church is its calling. It began on December 4th, 1973 in the PCA. There has always been a war for the church. There have always been battles. War for the church is the church's calling. Beloved, the visible church isn't called the Ecclesia Militans for nothing. The church militant, that is what we are. We are all soldiers in the Lord's army. We are all commissioned by the captain of our souls to fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil. We are fighting very real spiritual battles, not just in our own hearts, but in the church. We are called to fight against doctrinal drift and false teaching. We are under divine orders to protect the church from being captured by earthly wisdom and insidious, ever-shifting cultural creeds that exist in our generation. Paul exhorts us in Colossians 2.8 to see to it that no one takes you, what? Captive. See to it that no one takes you captive. This is war language. By philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Dear Christian, high on your priority list should be the avoidance of unbiblical ideologies that would capture your mind and your heart. Dear pastor, dear pastor, high on your priority list should be equipping your congregation to identify and to flee from unbiblical ideologies that are not according to Christ. And these ideologies are coming through the computers and the flat screens and the phones of all of your people every single day. I would say it's pastoral uh, dereliction for us not to inform our people about how to think rightly about these new ideologies that have emerged in our culture and have found their way into our churches. Church history is filled with inspiring stories of believers fighting for orthodoxy, Men and women who, who took the Holy Spirit's appeal seriously in Jude 3, that is, to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. In the pages of history, we read about Athanasius' fight against Arianism and Augustine's epic battle with Pelagianism. And then there's the late medieval fight for orthodoxy by men like Wycliffe and Huss and Tyndale, courageous men who paved the way for the magisterial 16th century reformers. Men like Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and Knox, along with their brave wives. They all fought for truth with conviction and blood earnestness against the deceitful schemes of the devil, so evident in the medieval Roman Catholic Church. They took doctrine seriously. They took doctrine seriously. Indeed, unlike uh, doctrinal indifferentists in our day who are more animated by sports or politics or social action than theological error, the reformers were willing to die in their quest to reform the doctrine of the church. The battle for orthodoxy continued into the 17th and 18th centuries. There we find the English Puritans boldly contending for the truth against the errors of Arminianism and sacerdotalism and antinomianism and universalism and myriad forms of false worship. They were stalwarts of the faith. And what about the two Margarets who gave their lives for the truth during the killing times in Scotland? The next two centuries saw brave warriors like Charles Hodge and Samuel Miller and J. Gresham Machen contending for Reformed Orthodoxy within the church. Of course, the battle for Orthodoxy within the church continued into the 1950s and 60s in the PCUS. This directly relates to our story in the PCA. As many of you know, theological liberalism, like an aggressive cancer, took root, spread, and metastasized in the churches of the PCUS in the 50s and 60s. And it wasn't just theological error. It was heresy that prevailed in the churches. 
Ordained men in the PCUS, PCUS, for example, denied the bodily, physical, bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The inerrancy, authority, and sufficiency of Scripture were publicly repudiated. The social gospel replaced the true mission of the church. The mission of the church turned into initiatives related to social justice and political activism and cultural transformation. Sadly, replacing the Christ-mandated apostolic focus on the preaching of the Word of God and the regeneration of sinners and the making of mature disciples through the means of grace. I remember several years ago in a, in a, in a, in a PCA presbytery, uh, during the worship service, uh, the minister said, we need to stop thinking so much about the salvation of souls and start thinking more about the redemption of the earth. These are the kinds of things that they were hearing in the PC US in the 60s. There was also an emphasis on unity over truth, on service over fidelity to the truth. A favorite slogan, of course, was doctrine divides and service unites. Moreover, in 1965, the first woman was ordained to the ministry in the PC US, and homosexuality had already gained a foothold in the churches. So as you can see, things were really, really bad. Jack Williamson, in his 1973 General Assembly Address that I referenced earlier, lamented the horrible state of the PCUS. This is what he said, quote, Our beloved former church has continued the fetish for ecumenism so that the form of unity, regardless of the faith, has become its goal. But her greatest deviation from her historic witness has been in her attitude towards the scriptures. The true church of Jesus Christ belongs to those who by the grace of God are faithful to the scriptures. He goes on. The higher critical theories of scripture and the neo-orthodox views of scripture have become the dominant and official position of the PCUS today. Men are consistently being ordained in the PCUS presbyteries who deny card cardinal doctrines of Scripture. Universalism, universalism is being openly defended in the courts of the PCUS. And what's the result of this denial of Scripture in the church? Williamson said this, quote, The zeal for the gospel of Jesus Christ is lost, and the temper of the times dictates the religious cause for the day. The zeal for the gospel of Jesus Christ is lost, and the temper of the times dictates the religious cause for the day. Brothers and sisters, times are indeed perilous in a denomination when zeal for the true gospel is lost or waning and the times, rather than the Bible, dictate her mission and her message. You know, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 declares, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel, he said. And for Paul to say that, it's quite something. His countrymen wanted to kill him. The state wanted to incarcerate him and eventually took his life. He had those that would mock him, those that would beat him, and yet he could stand and say, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why was he not ashamed of the gospel? He gives us the answer in verse 16. For it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe, to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. You see, when the gospel is faithfully preached, and, and not, not some twisted gospel, but a gospel that has the content of the person and finished work of Jesus Christ, Christ crucified and risen for sinners, then it is the operative power of God through that preaching whereby God raises up the spiritual dead to spiritual life. Amen? If we get away from that gospel, we begin to decline as a church. 
we must be passionate about that gospel, the content of the gospel that Paul and the apostles preach in the New Testament, not some new version, which we are seeing creeping into the churches today. We must not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and all of its foolishness, as it were, in the way the world considers it. Well, after Williamson's description of the compromised state of the PCUS, he recounts the different ways that he and his fellow soldiers fought for orthodoxy in the PCUS over those many years. He said this, quote, We cannot possibly give credit to all who have fought so valiantly to return that beloved church to her true mission. Such Christian soldiers are legion, but we must mention some of the major groups which have sought to defend the faith once delivered to the saints. And then Williamson recounts a few of these organizations that emerged in these days in order to fight for the truth. The Presbyterian Journal, established in 1942, renamed in 1959, a, a journal that was established to promote and to defend biblical fidelity and confessional integrity and the PCUS. Secondly, there was the Presbyterian Evangelistic Fellowship, established in 1958, PEF, a fellowship of elders who, whose purpose was to advance the gospel through faithful preaching and bold evangelism that was seeking conversions and that sought to do true discipleship. It was a clear response to the social gospel that had taken the reins in the PCUS. Thirdly, there were the Concerned Presbyterians, established in 1964. Presbyterian laymen who were committed to winning and discipling souls for Jesus. They sought to bring the church back to its true mission, the mission that was given by Christ very clearly in the Great Commission in Matthew 28 and modeled by the apostles. And then there was the Presbyterian Churchmen United, established in 1969. Over 500 ministers had signed a document called the Declaration of Commitment, a clarion call to return to the Word of God and to return to the Reformed faith. They actually published this in 30 different major newspapers. Williamson declared that these initiatives, quote, attempted to stop the liberal trends in the Presbyterian Church in the United States towards humanism, secularism, and syncretism. Interestingly, Williamson noted all of the progressive trends that the Presbyterian Journal warned of 25 years earlier, all but one of those actually moved to full-fledged liberalism. Perhaps there is a slippery slope after all. Again, Williamson shared... We tried to return the church to its true mission. Instead of being able to stop the trends, they seemed to get worse as the liberals intensified their efforts uh, in reaction to our opposition. Suffice it to say that several years ago, it became the consensus of our leaders that the historic witness of our beloved church was gradually being liquidated. And for those who felt a duty to preserve it, division became the only answer. And so, Williamson declared, today we raise a fresh, clear banner of truth of our Lord, our living Lord Jesus Christ before this watching world, and it shall stand out distinctive. It shall not be conformed to this world. It shall be a standard to which the wise and the just may repair. Following in the true apostolic tradition, we are but continuing a true branch of the church of Jesus Christ. In fact, he says it like this, in the true church of Jesus Christ. A true branch of the church of Jesus Christ on this earth, God being our helper, we can do no other. Oh, to be there, to hear that. Rousing address. What a bold and hope-filled first message for the new Presbyterian denomination that would become the PCA. It's a message that, unlike progressive and liberal expressions of Christianity, unashamedly emphasizes the spirit-wrought salvation of sinners from death and hell. It's a message that underscores the true mission of the visible church to preach Christ from all of Scripture, to call sinners to repentance and faith, and to take seriously the making of mature disciples. It's what Paul labored and toiled to do, Colossians chapter 1. And also to send out ordained ministers 
to plant and strengthen churches around the world through the ordinary means of grace, to really believe in the means that Christ himself has given the church for the salvation of the elect to the ends of the earth. Now that's a mission that I can get behind. That's a mission I am passionate about. That's why I joined the PCA. Because of that mission, a mission that I saw being carried out at Christ Covenant Church in Matthews, North Carolina, where Harry Reader was the minister. It's a mission that I've seen carried out in numerous churches across the PCA. I think it's why we are all a part of the PCA. Amen? Indeed, for almost half a century, we've seen God work mightily through this biblical vision. It's no exaggeration to say that millions have received spiritual help and encouragement from the PCA. Our churches, our ministers, our agencies have been used of God in extraordinary ways. It must be said that the PCA over the decades have made valiant stands for truth. Together, we've resisted doctrinal error like federal vision and women's ordination and the insider movement. We've adopted overall good, though not, though not binding, statements on race, women in the church, and human sexuality. While we all know that there have been varied expressions and applications of reformed confessionalism in the PCA, we've managed to work together for the glory of God despite those differences. In fact, we've been able to learn from one another in the various ways that we live out the Reformed faith. We give thanks to God for this. And we say with the psalmist how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. But dear friends, things in the PCA are noticeably, noticeably different now. They are noticeably different. Many from inside and from outside the PCA view it as an unprecedented time of doctrinal drift. That's in part why we are here. More than a few of us are concerned about what we are hearing and seeing in our presbyteries, and agencies, and churches. In the last couple of years, at least, 20 conservative churches have left the PCA. Many other pastors and congregations are thinking to do, to do the same. I'm receiving phone calls from individuals and in other Reformed denominations saying, what do I do with all these PCA ministers and retired ministers and churches that are contacting us about joining us? I'm regularly having to tell people to slow down and don't go. Several conscientiously reformed seminarians over the last two years, and I've visited several seminaries in various capacities, they're, they're saying to me, uh, Pastor John, I, I don't know if I have a place in the PCA. It's, it's so different than what it was. In, in their perception, they're saying it's so different than what, it, what, I, what I remember it being when I was growing up and I have strong reform convictions. I'm not sure that I could minister there. Dear ones, the GRN receives communications on a weekly, often daily basis from concerned officers and congregants around the PCA. Many from both inside and outside the PCA are asking what in the world is going on in the PCA. So perhaps you're thinking, what is the problem here? Well, there's been a discernible and growing shift in focus and emphasis. What kind of a shift? A shift away from the old paths of reformed ministry. That which we heard about earlier in the lecture from Dr. Vicky. A shift away from that. It's a shift away from reformed worship, evangelism, mission, discipleship. A shift away from that which was trumpeted at our first General Assembly in 1973. Dear ones, it's a clear shift away from Reformed orthodoxy and a shift towards a new brand of progressivism, 
a new way of approaching ministry that's more than a little informed by sociology, psychology, and cultural ideology. It's an approach that applies a cultural human hermeneutic to ministry. It's a, tend, a tendency to major on contextualization and to minor on the ordinary means of grace. A proclivity to adopt cultural trends in the church, trends which undermine both the mission and the message of the church. Dear ones, we've been reminded this evening that the arch, the arch enemy to orthodoxy within the PCUS in the 50s and 60s was theological liberalism. Theological liberalism was and remains a plain and obvious enemy, an easily detectable enemy to biblical Christianity. The main threat to the PCA's orthodoxy, however, is less obvious, but equally destructive. The threat is less obvious, but equally destructive. That threat, that enemy, is theological progressivism. What is theological progressivism? What is progressive Christianity? Well, uh, you ask a hundred uh, men that question, I'll give you a hundred different answers. It's a bit of a, uh, like nailing jello to the wall to come up with definitions like this. Uh, but this is what I came up with. It's that which emphasizes social justice and cultural transformation over the salvation of souls and basic Christian discipleship and which prioritizes social action over world mission for the salvation of souls and over the ordinary means of grace, and that which sympathetically assumes and accommodates significant aspects of the culture's narrative, especially as it concerns racial injustice, intersectionality, and human sexuality. It's an approach to Christianity that at best marginalizes the true gospel and at worst redefines it. I've had, hold on to your seats here, I've had not one but many contact me personally from around the PCA, from various congregations saying, I have not heard the gospel preached in months. Another reached out and said, we prayed a prayer of confession in our church asking God to forgive us for our whiteness. Oh, you, you've heard nothing. I, I could spend the rest of this lecture sharing with you things that would, would concern you greatly, and it should. Mike Horton warns about redefining the mission of the church. He says, when we allow something other than the gospel to determine the identity of the church, our mission becomes an extension of the powers of this present age rather than the inbreaking of the age to come. Back to Romans 1, 16 and 17. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for in it, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. It is, it is the operative power of God through the preaching of the word of God, the gospel of God, that brings God's elect to himself. That is the mission of the church. It's being undermined. This new brand of progressivism has infiltrated the PCA, and it has done so primarily through two unbiblical movements. The first one is side B gay celibate Christianity, which is a fruit of the sexual revolution. And the second one is social justice, a movement which is informed by the false assumptions of critical race theory. I want to say a few words about side B gay celibate Christianity and say even less words about the social justice movement, but I do want to touch upon these. Side B gay celibate Christianity affirms biblical marriage and believes homosexual practice to be disordered and sinful. They believe that homosexuality is not a part of God's design and thus a consequence of the fall. Okay, so far, so good. But the problem lies at the level of desires and perceived identity. Moreover, there is a deficient view of gospel sanctification. 
Let me explain with four brief points. The side B gay Christian position maintains and even at times celebrates his or her gay identity. This is why they will often refer to themselves as gay Christians and form groups around their identities. Identity, rather. Gayness, they say, is part of who they are and not just unnatural and disordered sexual desires. Rosaria Butterfield explains that for side B Christians, quote, gayness is a category of personhood. It essentially describes who a person is, end quote. Secondly, they maintain that as gay Christians, they, will, uh, they take pride in aspects of gay culture, including a penchant for effeminacy. Thirdly, side B teaches that same-sex attraction is of sin, a result of the fall, but not a sin, that which should be repented of. They do not therefore believe that it is a sin to be, quote, gay. Fourthly, they teach that while homosexual lust ought to be and should be mortified daily, there is little expectation of true, lasting, spirit-wrought transformation. The weakening or eradication of same-sex attraction is mostly viewed as impossible, which is in part why they have this emphasis upon gay celibacy and platonic spiritual friendships with gay partners rather than a reordered and sanctified sexuality. The Side B Gay Movement was introduced to the PCA and the wider evangelical church through the Revoice Conference, 2018. It's a movement that sent shockwaves across the evangelical world and has brought false teaching into the church. As many of you will know, Revoice was hosted by one of our own PCA churches in St. Louis, and a prominent leader within Revoice is a PCA minister. Sadly, the movement has received sympathy and cover from many around the PCA. According to many in the PCA, the Revoice movement is another, quote, nothing to see here, move along moment. They might not get everything perfectly right, they say, but the heart is good behind it, and we need not be so concerned about this. Now, we don't have time to unpack all that is wrong with this movement, but a couple of points will suffice. Number one, the Christian's true identity is in Christ alone. Amen? Amen? It's in Christ alone. And thus, Christians should never be named by their sins. Our study report brought this out very well. You see, we are united to Christ and not to our sin. By God's sovereign grace, we've been set free from sin, and we are no longer held captive by it. Alive in Christ, we've died to sin, and so we no longer live in it. Embracing the gay Christian moniker and maintaining a gay identity, therefore, is thoroughly unbiblical. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do, you, do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. And such, not, and such are some of you. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Our associate uh, minister has been preaching through the book of Leviticus in our evening services, and he preached through Leviticus 18 recently. It's just a, a list of the sexual sins of, of the surrounding pagan nations, and, and, and Moses is showing them, we cannot live like this. We must reject this kind of... Uh, 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 deviation from biblical sexuality. They're not to adopt in any way the, the sins of the culture that surrounds them. And I started thinking as, as uh, uh, Michael was preaching, never would an Israelite refer to himself or herself as a gay Israelite. Dear ones, sin should never define a Christian believer, period. 
Christians repent of sin and kill sin. We are never named by them or owned by them. Secondly, if a Christian has a proclivity towards a certain sin, he or she should flee from the culture and community that celebrates it. Thirdly, as strong as homosexual desires and unnatural attractions may be, they do not define one's essence or personhood. The essence of a person is not in his or her unnatural and sinful sexual desires. It's in the fact that we are all made in the image of God. And Christ came to renew that image within us through his death and resurrection. Fourthly, homosexual desires and attractions are not just of sin. They are sin even if those desires are not carried out. Homosexual attraction is not just a disordered condition of the fall to be managed. It's a sin to be repented of and mortified. Fifthly, and this is a a word to all those who struggle with same-sex attraction. There's bound to be those in this very room who do. This is such an important point. There is hope in the gospel. There is hope in the gospel, not just a hope for heaven, not just a hope for something better later. The power of God now coming through the gospel. There's a hope for real change now in this life, a hope for change. The gospel is powerful and has the power to change affections, to to weaken and even change attractions and desires. This is good news for all who struggle with this sin. Turretin writes this, quote, Scripture extends sanctification not only to acts, but to the renovation of the nature itself. Paul prays for the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, the sanctification of their whole spirit and soul and body, the renovation of the mind and will and sensual appetite. He goes on to write, Sanctification does not consist in a correction of life and morals alone, as the Socinians maintain. Rather, it consists in a change and renovation of the nature itself, corrupted by original sin, by which depraved qualities and habits are cast out and good ones infused so that the man desists from evil acts and strives for good. And I have a third Turretin quote for no extra charge. As the corruption of sin infects the whole nature, not only as to acts, but also to habits, so sanctification ought to include a reformation of the whole nature, habitual as well as actual. This is not a form of perfectionism or triumphalistic uh, sanctification. It's the Christian life. It's the Christian life. Yes, we have remaining corruption, sin, no longer reigns in us, but it certainly remains in us, and we fight against it every day. But those, Paul says in Galatians 5, 24, who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We don't make these things a part of our identity. The side B narrative is that no person with homosexual desires has ever been free of them that they know of, they say. Well, I've had numerous men over the years express to me personally that they've gotten caught up in the perversion of homosexuality, but by God's grace and the life-changing power of the gospel, repented, got married, have children, grandchildren, and these desires have been greatly weakened at times, so weak that they can hardly even know that they're there anymore. This is the hope of the gospel. These same people have said to me personally, tell the GRN for me, please, to keep preaching against the Revoice movement. Because if the Revoice movement was around when I came to know Christ and I was an early Christian trying to figure this all out, I would have been very confused. In fact, Rosaria Butterfield said as much in an interview. The gospel not only saves, it transforms. It not only justifies, it sanctifies. 
It's not only declarative, it's transformative. It not only rescues, it renovates. The second front that we must fight in the PCA is against the social justice movement, critical race theory. Over the past five years, the modern social justice movement has swept across America like a tsunami. Through various advocacy groups and political influence, the movement has caused deep racial divisions in our country, deep as ever. It's caused great violence and destruction in our cities. It has fostered suspicion and hatred in our country. And sadly, it has also come into our churches and it's wreaking havoc in many evangelical denominations. I have two teenagers. The conversations that we are having around our dinner table with the sexual revolution and the woke revolution raging are just, I just can't believe I'm having these conversations with my kids. I never would have thought. But here we are. And this social justice movement is informed by critical race theory, a, a secular worldview that sees virtually everything through the lenses of systemic oppression, structural power, and racial injustice. It views everyone as either an oppressed minority or an oppressor from the majority culture. And it makes numerous assumptions about reality that just are not true. And we must not believe those lies. One of these lies is that every white person is a racist and every black person is systematically oppressed and is a victim. CRT, critical race theory, is the foundation and fuel of identity politics. Dear ones, the social justice movement is coercive, fallacious, misleading, and thus incompatible with biblical Christianity. And it shows because the churches that have embraced this woke ideology have stopped preaching the gospel. They've stopped seeing the loveliness and the beauty of Christ crucified and risen for sinners. This ideology sadly has found its way into our PCA pulpits and Sunday school classrooms. I see and hear the evidence of it weekly, but it must be resisted. Dear ones, the social justice movement has no place in the church. It should be given no quarter in the church. The fact is the modern social justice movement and side B, gay Christianity, attack the gospel at its core, declaring that the gospel is not enough that Christ crucified and risen is not enough, that the word of God is not enough, that the mission that Christ gave to his church is not enough. I say it is enough. It's important, brothers and sisters, that you hear me say this evening that these two unbiblical movements must be given no place in the Presbyterian church in America. And if it is given a place and a seat at the table, in the Presbyterian Church in America, many will not be able to stay in good conscience in this denomination. Make no mistake about it, these movements are enemies of the true gospel and enemies of true gospel unity in the church. There's no need for us to eat the meat and spit out the bones of these secular ideologies. You know what we need, indeed, what we all need are the meat and bones of the gospel. God's word is authoritative and sufficient, and I believe that a renewed emphasis on faithful preaching and on faithful praying and on carrying out the mission of the church as Christ has so clearly laid out in Matthew 28 will be that which will help us to reach sinners for Christ and be faithful in our ministries. We don't need discipleship from the gurus of the modern sexual and woke revolutions. So here we are. 48 years after the opening worship service at the first PCA General Assembly. What would our forefathers say to us now? I believe that they would exhort us to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ, to fight for the truth, to contend for the faith. They would warn us that to ignore these very real and present threats to orthodoxy in the PCA is to acquiesce 
And this is the death of denominations, you know. The quiet and unbothered acceptance of error by the moderate middle. Therefore, if you love the PCA, you must speak up. If you love the PCA, you must teach your congregations to say no to these progressive trends. You must raise your voice in your presbyteries. You must. You say, oh, pastor, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to do that. Life's too busy. It's just such a, a cesspool of, of, of nastiness. I hardly, I hardly even understand these movements. Well, listen to Luther if you won't listen to me. Quote, if I profess with the loudest voice and the clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ. However boldly I may be professing Christ. Where the battle rages, Luther says, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on all the battlefield besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. Our PCA forefathers were not a perfect group of men, but they were men who did believe in the power and sufficiency of the Word of God. Jack Williamson said this to, to the new denomination, to the new gathered assembly of the PCA, quote, we must work. Remember that the true war cry of the church is Gideon's watchword, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. God must do it, but we are not to be idle. End quote. And so how do we fight for orthodoxy and a healthy future PCA? How do we fight for what I like to call warm-hearted confessional Presbyterianism? Well, the first thing we must do is pray. We must pray. You know, we are so prone just to do everything and say, well, I guess we've done all we can do. Now let's just pray to the Lord of the universe. I guess we'll just do that now. Prayer should be the first thing we do. Listen to what Jack Williamson says. Brethren, in conclusion, we must undergird this church with a great outgoing of prayer. We know it is far easier to fight than it is to pray. Let's commit to pray. Pray in your session. Pray in your church. If you don't have a prayer meeting in your church, start one and pray at it. Pray with your family. Pray with your kids. Get your kids involved in this time of praying and fighting for truth. May they know that their, their parents are serious about the truth of God and the gospel. We must pray. We must teach. As I mentioned before, we must help educate our people to understand what we need to reject. Of course, we hate true racism, and we must preach against it with all of our hearts and never allow it within our churches. We must openly and uh, lovingly welcome those who would come into our church who struggle with same-sex attraction. We must have them in our homes and be hospitable and reach out to them with the gospel. Some of my progressive friends think we've never even met anyone like this. And I know many of you in these pews have many in your churches that are just like this, that have experienced the life-changing power of the gospel. That must be the approach. The third thing is we must say no to the lies of the sexual revolution and the woke revolution. Say no to the unbiblical teachings and assumptions of the progressive woke and sexual movements. Say no to that which is greatly undermining the spiritual mission of the church. I'd also like to say to those who may be on the progressive wing of the denomination, don't divide the PCA. I love many of my progressive brothers. I've had many wonderful conversations and exchanges, and we are in two very different places on a lot of issues. That we've all found that out. They're probably saying amen right now, if they're watching or here. 
But may I say, don't split the PCA. This woke revolution, this sexual revolution that has come, has come to us. We have not gone looking for it. It has come into the PCA, and now it's there. And it's unbiblical. If you want that expression of of a church, then go to a church who is already doing that. I'm sure they would welcome you. Don't split the PCA. Don't sever this wonderful denomination. If you want a church that focuses on social activism, then go to a, a denomination that makes that their focus. Join the one that already embraces that mission. Finally, fight for orthodoxy. Fight with zeal, but fight with love. From time to time, I come across a, someone who's very passionate about Reformed confessionalism, and they're just angry. After about two minutes, I'm like, get me out of here. We must fight with zeal, but with love. Love for God, love for our Savior, love for the truth. May we fight with tears in our eyes. You know, one of the, the hallmarks of Jack Williams' sermon was he said over and over again about the tears that have fallen for the church of Jesus Christ and the PCUS. He loved that church. That's why they fought. May we fight with tears in our eyes and love in our hearts, even love for those who are our theological opponents. May we seek to win not just the arguments, but their hearts with the truth. And may we love, have love for the lost as we do as well. If you are in a church where you are concerned about what's going on, ask your pastor, ask your elders. Say, pastor, what is this? why are you doing this? What does this mean? Try to understand. Seek to bring change. Richard Caldwell, excuse me, uh, Watson, Thomas Watson said this, the profaneness of the times should not slacken but heighten our zeal. May this be true. The horse and chariot are made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. I want to end with the words of Jack Williamson, though, and the end of his sermon. Today we reaffirm allegiance to Christ as King and Lord of his church the sole lawgiver in Zion, and we remember his promise that the gates of hell shall not prevail against him. And let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this time where we can consider some sober uh, topics connected to the PCA. We love this church, and we pray, Lord, that you would grant us the grace and the fortitude and the courage to fight for that which is right and true and biblical, that we would be faithful churchmen within our presbyteries, that we would attend general assembly, that we would, would do that which we are called to do, to be faithful, uh, to, to write overtures, to, uh, to plead with brothers in Christ from view, with views that are unbiblical, uh, that we would not be found on the sidelines but on the playing field uh, for your glory and for the health of the PCA. We pray in Jesus' name.